Okay, I think we are live. Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to another episode of Muslim Women in Science and Technology. Um, so we're just going to wait a little bit before you officially begin so that more of you can join us in. Uh, so today's episode is also very, very exciting because we have an amazing, amazing scientist with us today. And uh, the interesting thing is, um, if you guys tune in, you're going to be able to find out uh, what her super title is. I mean, she has an amazing title and I'm just waiting to find out what the backstory is. So stay tuned to find out what her superhero title is. So we're just going to wait a little bit longer. And if you guys have not already watched our first episode, uh, which we had on regenerative medicine with Dr. Hina Chaudhary, so hurry on up and go to our Facebook page and our YouTube channel so that you guys can watch it because it was an incredible session. So if you haven't, just hurry up and watch it because it's, it was so much fun. Not only will you get to know more about regenerative medicine in that episode, but you will also get to know an inspiring story by an, by an amazing uh, scientist. So hurry on up. So just a few more minutes and then we'll officially begin. I don't know if you guys can feel it, but I'm very, very excited for today's episode as well. Leave some comments below if you guys already know what an astrophysicist is and what they do. Because I want to know how many of you guys already know what an astrophysicist is. Because to be honest, I didn't have much of a clue before. So if you guys already know uh, what an astrophysicist is and what they do, so leave us a comment below. Just a little bit more so that more of you join us and we will officially begin in about one minute. All right, everyone, it's 9 p.m. and I think I'm going to start. So assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Nimra Khurum and welcome to another star-studded episode of Muslim Women in Science and Technology Stories from Around the World. So let me tell you a bit about the series. Uh, this series is a celebration and a tribute to all the Muslim women in STEM. So we will not only get to know their incredible work, but we will also um, get to know exactly who they are, what some of their motivations were and their struggles to throughout their journey. Uh, so for today's episode, which is titled The um, Astronomy and Beyond, we will be venturing deep into what is astrophysics, uh, or uh, what are astrophysicists, and why do we need to be excited about this field? Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce my guest speaker for tonight. Uh, she is known as the Iron Lady uh, by astronomers and physicists alike. She is an atomic astrophysicist and an APS fellow and a research professor at the university uh, and a research professor at the Department of Astronomy, the Ohio State University, USA. She has a BS honor in physics from Dhaka University, Bangladesh, as well as a master's in theoretical physics. She earned her PhD in theoretical atomic physics at Wayne State University in Detroit and completed a postdoctoral appointment at Georgia University 
uh, Georgia State University before joining Ohio State University as a researcher. She has received countless awards, including 2013's John Wheatley Award, and was the recipient of the highest honor gold medal from the Tropical Society of Laser Sciences. This incredible lady is also the founder of the International Society of Muslim Women in Science and has been a driving force in promoting physics research and teaching in several third world countries. I present to you Dr. Sultana N. Nahir. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sultana. How are you doing? Walaikum salam, Nimra. Um, I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm good, Alhamdulillah. I feel such an honor having you on our show tonight. It's, it's amazing for me. I'm starstruck right now. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity uh, by Cosme Science Society and the invitation by you to meet a lot of people uh, through this uh, program. And uh, I'm really fortunate to meet them and <clears throat> uh, welcome everyone to this program. And um, thank you for coming. And they said, um, Asalaamu As Alaikum to everyone. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. So um, I think we should just jump right into our webinar series. Uh, so for today's session, before I get to know more about you into our heart and heart session, uh, I would like to uh, I would like for you to share with us what is an ast astrophysicist, uh, what is it that they exactly do, and your phenomenal work in the field. All right. Um, I can give a short tour. Okay. Um, so I'm just going through my slides. Um, yeah, I will. I will put your slides on now. All right. Is it on now? Okay. So um, yes, it is, and we can see it. Uh, and astronomy means is study of anything outside uh, um, our Earth. Okay. So we there are three kinds of um, people who study the space outside the Earth. This definition is not very well defined. But um, uh, in general, they, that's the way they are. Observers, that means uh, uh, the scientists who look through telescopes, which can be space-based or ground-based. And they uh, see the objects, take the picture, image, or spectrum of the object, and clean it, and they identify whatever they can. So they are called observers. Then comes modelers, who take that observation and uh, try to identify more lines and try to find out the physical condition and the chemical composition of the object. So they need, they put a lot of um, uh, atomic parameters into it and model it. The third group is called I, actually the astrophysicist, uh, um, which group actually provide the actual uh, uh, atomic data or molecular data. They go to the models and also to the observers. So it, they study the physics, um, the underlying science of these observations. And I'm an atomic astrophysicist. And so I do study the dominant atomic processes in the astrophysical plasmas. You know, all the stars, they are just made of plasmas. In fact, the whole universe, all the matter, 99% of the matter is plasma. When I say plasma, it means the atoms, they are not completely neutral. That means some of the electrons have been stripped off, so they are charged, okay? So, and they may be in gaseous state. Okay, so there are four metamic processes that I study, like um, the atoms excited by a photon, which is the unit of light. So from a star, a light is coming and going hit an atom uh, in a plasma and atom gets excited and which means it absorbs the photon excited, it comes down, and when it comes down, it gives out a photon. So that is excitation. We can have excitation by electron, electrons are moving, so it can heat the atom and excite it. But no atom can exci stay excited for a longer time, it has to come down. When it comes down, it gives out the photon, which we catch through telescope and study. The other process is like ionization by photon. Ionization means the photo, uh, atom which has the electrons around it, one of the electron will free the atom so that the atom will be charged and it will have more positive charge than uh, atom. Atom is actually neutral. So we call it uh, ionization or photo ionization. 
And another process is uh, electron recombining to an atom by giving out a photon. So we say when electron is attached to an atom, it has negative energy. And when it is free, we call it, we say it has positive energy. So when he's joining the atom and now where there's a vacancy, so it has to give out some energy in terms of photon to combine that atom. So all these four processes either absorb photon or give out photon, okay? So these are the <coughs> processes I study. Okay, as she also asked me why should be exciting to study this subject. Okay, see, this is just a beautiful picture of our own galaxy, which is Milky Way, right? It is so beautiful at night and it is so vast, it's so big. It has 200 to 400 billion stars. And it is very important to study the space because I'm going to give an example it's very important for us to study the space. So we study that. Not only that, space is fascinating with beauty and bounty. <clears throat> so this is an example, very simple example that uh, tells us why we should study space or uh, astronomy. So in 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs ruled the earth, right? They were happily ruling the earth until, <clears throat> sorry, an asteroid came and hit the Earth. When it hit, it was a huge hit. So it produced a lot of dust and the air circulated the dust around the Earth and blocked the sunlight coming down to, on the surface. So the surface become cold and the Earth become cold. All those, you know, everything underneath froze to death, including the dinosaurs. So in the next, you know, this picture, you can see that he is watching the this heat and this explosion, explosion, but he cannot do anything, right? He doesn't go to his school. He didn't go to his school. He he was not studying science. He didn't know how to protect himself. But you know, this incident hitting the Earth by asteroids is not gone. You can see in the bottom picture. You know, this is the map of the whole Earth. And you see all the dots, they correspond to the heat by external meteors or asteroid hitting the Earth at various places. So they are hitting the last one, a big one was in 2018, December. It came, it was a big one, but it fell in Siberia on a river. So we know there was no human casualty. And this one shows an example of the heat. So this is a lake in Tajikistan up in the mountain. And this lake was created by a heat, by an asteroid. The water you now just very salty, so there is no green around it. So you can see that you know we are not very much protected, even though we are studying, but we still don't know how to protect ourselves from this kind of disaster. But our brain is there and we have a lot of ideas. See, this is one main idea is here in the Star Trek, one of the episodes. See, whenever it is traveling, it sees something, asteroid or something blocking, or it is moving toward a planet or on its path. It has a laser tractor beam to shift it a little bit away. And it is little shift is enough because there's not much gravity to pull it in otherwise. But this kind of power, we still don't have. So we don't know how to stop it. So who is going to do build up that kind of technology? It is we have to build up that kind of technology to protect us. Not only that, right now we are doing fine, but what will happen in future? See, even five or to seven billion years, our sun is right now, say for example, at this size, it will become this size. So it will become, it's called a red giant star because all the hydrogen in it, that all become helium. So that means the fuel is gone, then things will collapse and then it will expand, become a red giant star. And our earth will be engulfed by this you know, formation and we'll all die. But with our brain in, my, in our head, so we cannot let our future generation just deplete like that, right? So 
what we have been doing, we have been looking for planets. And uh, we are finding a lot of planets outside our solar system. Any planet outside our solar system that belongs to some other star, we call it exoplanet. We knew, we had that uh, feeling that you know, exoplanets exist, but we did not actually physically see it until you know, 2004. Then this was, was detected. This is a star and this planet belongs to that star. So this is an exoplanet for this star. So we have been searching so far, we have found 4,000 exoplanets, but our objective is to do what? To find a habitable exoplanet where we can go and the, the surface has to be solid so that we can walk. It has to have oxygen. We can breathe and water and we cannot be too close to the star because otherwise the radiation will burn, cause cancer and the human population will deplete. So we have found a habitable planet which is like the belonging to the nearest star for the sun. Sun is our own star. That uh, exoplanet uh, uh, is habitable, and if we want to go there with current technology, it will take 18,000 years. That's too long, you know. We can, don't have that kind of technology, and our generations have to continue for 18,000 years to reach there. But, see, we are always uh, thinking also, there is an idea that if we can send a probe there, for example, a tiny probe, which will be forced, not by usual you know, solar energy or uh, nuclear fission, which is typically used. We can use a laser so that it can propel the probe at the one fourth the speed of the light. So if it reaches there, it will take 20 years, still within our lifetime. So who is going to build that technology? We, right? That means you, whoever listening, everyone. So. So it is important to study the stars and the space and the stars we study through the light that reaches us. This light is actually the one we catch. They are generated by the atoms or molecules, mostly the atoms. So I'll show you why, what do you know, this atom do that we can create a photon. So this is a very simple picture of an atom. This is the nucleus with protons and neutrons and the electrons are going around. Even though this picture shows beautiful and you know, a circular path, but in reality, electrons have their own orbits. So it will be maybe one orbit here, one electron, maybe another one going here. So they are fixed. The electrons are not found in between two orbits. So that's why we call these orbits are quantized. So if electron wants to go from one orbit to another orbit, it has to absorb some energy to go to the higher orbit. So we call absorption. It can be a photon absorption to go there, or it can be also by a collision. But after it goes there, it has to come down after some time. So it has to give out that energy out, which comes out as a photon. So we call in this energy of the orbitals like line, you know, this energy or that energy or that energy, but nothing in between. And because of this structure, naturally formed, we can get a lot of information about atoms, not only atoms, all the astronomical objects. So what happens if the if we get you know there are infinite number of levels, that means electron can jump to many levels and we can have all kinds of photons coming out but they will have different energies. So if we pass that light through some slit, we can separate out all those energy, different kind of energetic photons. And that means for different energy photons with different colors. So for example, this is that kind of spectrum of carbon. So the carbon light is going through a slit and it is forming lines like this. It is called a spectrum. Means we have split the color of carbon into its own component colors. And this also, you know, this split of colors happens all the time in the nature. You can see near the Niagara Falls, there's a rainbow. So when sunlight goes through these water particles, which act like crystals, 
So the crystal, what they do, you know, the light gets split, you know, into its components. So that's why we see all this rainbow, okay? So this is called a spectrum, and I do a lot of spectroscopy. With the spectroscopy, we can get maximum amount of information compared to taking picture of the astronomical object, which gives a lot of information, size of the uh, object and the surrounding. And um, you can take a, a photometry. Uh, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about my own work. Nimra has definite time limit. I know she's also generous in time. Okay, let me talk about my work. I spend a lot of time studying the sun. Sun has many, many aspects to study, but I'll just talk uh, one thing at this time of my uh, aspect. This is the sun. So it's a very dense and very hot ball of plasma. And you can see uh, the, these are like, you know, ejection of materials from the sun. This sun, is, we call it, it's a black body. That means it has constant temperature all around. It's 5,700 degrees. But at that, when we have a black body at a constant temperature, we know it gives out flux. So at that temperature, it will be one kind of flux. If it's a different temperature, it will be a different flux. At 5,700 degree, the flux is like this, wavelength. Now, it's a different kind of photons. When I say wavelength, that means all kinds of photons are coming out in this wavelength range. And the, you can see the maximum flux will be coming around this wavelength, which is 5,000, and it belongs to yellow color. Uh, that's the reason we see sun as a yellow. But these are the inner you know, dots. They are the actual flux measured. So you can see there is matching the curve, but at this point, the flux is high. At this point, flux is low. So I will relate, check on this one, why the flux is low at this wavelength, OK? So this is some work I did. and. I did like atomic part and my collaborator, Professor Pratham did the modeling part. So this is called uh, opacity. Opacity is related to opaque. So it absorbs light. So here you can see all these lines like photons being absorbed at these wavelengths. And at this particular wavelength, this is log scale. We see the maximum absorption happens here. So this wavelength matches to this wavelength. So that means the sun has iron. Sun has, of course, everyone knows that sun has a lot of iron. So on the surface, there must be iron ion, which is absorbing the photons, reducing the flux. OK. Then you can ask, how come photo, uh, iron is heavy on the surface of the sun? It is largely made of hydrogen. Well, when you have too much radiation, it also causes pressure. We call it radiation pressure. So on the surface, gravity is pulling the iron inside, but the radiation pressure is pushing it outside because radiation is going out. When it is balanced, it just remains there. So that's how the iron is on the surface of the sun. All right, so this is another example what I study because these are all important to know. So after the red giant, you know, the, our sun will ultimately become a planetary nebula. Planetary nebula is kind of a dead star. So uh, this is so one planetary nebula. It has a very dense core inside, and these are gaseous. And we have found chlorine. That means, you know, when you did the spectroscopy, the lines, energy lines, matched with chlorine. So we know chlorine exists around here. If chlorine exists, then we can use that observation to find out what is the temperature, density, a lot of information. So I studied chlorine. And this particular process is called photoionization. That means photon is used by, uh, used by an electron to absorb and leave the atom so it becomes you know, ionized. So we call it photoionization. So I did photoionization calculation, and you don't have to read too much except that you know we see various uh, uh, panels in these panels I, I just this is an already published this panel i'm i'm showing you know how the photo ionization will look like at various excited states of the atom or the ion so but this but you can ask uh, is it real can you see this actually in reality yes you can 
So there was this experiment in like here. It is at um, place in University of California, Berkeley. And uh, this is the place where there's a synchrotron as there's a light source is called ALS, advanced light source. So they did the experiment on chlorine, same experiment, and this is the spectrum they have. But you can see that this spectrum is showing part of the features that theory is telling, okay? So that's how we prove that whatever we're doing, they are correct. Not all the features are seen, but they can see a, a number of features because experiment has other uncertainties. They usually cannot see the whole thing. But this is enough proof that everything is working fine and accuracy is very important. We call it benchmarking. That theory benchmark, that experiment, vice versa. Okay, my another project. This is interesting. So we know that we are made from stardust. What do you mean by stardust? We know with the elements we see in space, all those elements are in our body. So this is obvious or it clearly extrapolate, okay, we are made from stardust. So this is the cartoon of a human being made from stardust published by New York Times. Okay. Uh, so, but I like this picture. But uh, so whenever uh, we um, are interested in exoplanet and we try to find extraterrestrial life, well, we search for everything. We search for biosignatures. Like we have water in our body. We look for in, is there a water molecule in that exoplanet or in that atmosphere? Or uh, does it have oxygen, does it have methane? All kinds of things. Okay, so we have been looking for those in the uh, uh, various places. Strangely, we cannot find phosphorus, very little phosphorus we can find. But in contrast to that, our solar system is abundant with phosphorus. So it's, for example, this is the picture of a DNA. You can see all the red dots, that is phosphorus. Phosphorus is ingredient to a DNA because it is involved in signal passing or information passing. So we are detecting, now we're detecting some phosphorus, but this is the question. And why we can't see phosphorus in other places in space? So does it mean that we don't have any life form out there? But if we find some exoplanet or at some point in our supernova explosion phosphorus, maybe at that point we can search for a life. Maybe you can see something. But because of this, uh, lack of phosphorus in space, it was not studied before that much. So this is my one uh, project at this time um, with some students and one postdoc. So we are creating this spectrum, okay? So that means, you know, if we, if the telescope, we detect a photon at this energy, for example, a photon at this energy, okay? Then we'll, we'll match it, okay, this is, uh, this line it belongs to phosphorus. That means there's a chance that phosphorus is, you know, Phosphorus exists in that position or in that astronomical object. So, so this purpose of this work is to predict, you know, where, uh, what to look for to identify a phosphorus. All right. So let me see what is my next one. All right. So this is something you will like because I'm going to talk about our daily life. Okay. So a multidisciplinary aspect of astronomy. So astronomy, I will connect black hole to astronomy and so to cancer treatment. So cancer treatment, so what is the common thing between them? Black hole has x-rays and cancer patients are treated by x-rays. So that's the common thing. The physics is the same. <clears throat> so this is a black hole and uh, you know, these are low energy x-rays and right here we have very high energy x-rays. So that's an indication there is a black hole there because when the atoms move toward the black hole, you know, the electrons and the, uh, you know, the nucleus, they don't have the same speed because the pull is so strong that, you know, the atom is start to strip of electrons. By the time it goes there, it may have only two electrons and those are very tightly bound electrons. So uh, what they do, they get the energetic or super hot atoms or ions start to give out very high energy x-rays. And this is the indication. Because so if we want to study something, we have to have light from that. If black hole absorbs matter, also absorbs light, 
how can you see it? How can you tell there's a black hole? We, we tell there's a existence of a black hole from the surrounding spectrum. So this is a signature of a black hole. So this is, you know, lines, as I showed before, like carbon lines for iron. So this iron ion has lost all its electron. It has only two electrons, so, but they are tightly bound. So they're still existing. They are giving out photons. So all these photons should be lines like that, but instead of line, it has stretched out like this. So this was a puzzle for some time. What is that? You know, instead of lines, we have stretching, or there is no lines, no element is matching there, but iron matches there. So then we got the explanation. What is that? The photons, they are at this energy, they're trying to escape the black hole. So what they're doing, they're giving out part of their energy to escape and reach us, reach us. So that's why the energy has been stretched out like this because these photons have lost their energy to escape. And this one probably near the air, so we still have you know, this kind of lines at, at exact energy. So we study that. So what we did, and you know, we just got involved with the University of Rochester in the cancer treatment, they were contacted. We are doing, studying, you know, uh, gold nanoparticles for cancer treatment in the lab, but how come we, we know something, more electrons should come out, but uh, it is not. So then we got involved. Then we proposed a method. We, the name is pure physics. So not everyone will understand. It's called resonant nanoplasma theranostics. So what is that is simple. See, this is a tumor, cancerous tumor, and you have this radio sensitizing agent inside. And you are just uh, irradiating all these particles with x-rays. When it is coming here, this, you know, they will absorb the x-rays and the electrons will be ejected out. And the electron will attach to the nearby bad cells. And that way, those, all these bad cells will die. Attachment means, you know, the, that bad cell will die, the cancer cell will die. But why the electrons are not produced enough, we know what to do, at what energy, what to do to, to, to get the most efficient production of electrons here. So we call it RNPT. So we work, first we have the theory, then we have simulation to show that it is correct, we publish those. Then our student from biophysics did experiment with pathology professor um, cell liner, where you know, cancer cell uh, is culturally growth, and then you use this method and see uh, with that X-ray. So she also, Sarah Lim, also worked with radiation oncology, who radiated those uh, cancer cells with the particular energy that we gave, and there was a killing, cancer killing. It so everything worked. Then we moved to rat experiment then something happened, something, uh, people will laugh if I say something, but then it is stopped and Sarah has left. She has gone to Wisconsin for her job. So uh, we are continuing the work, but not anymore with living forms because we are punished because we didn't know how to take care of the rats properly. So the experiment could not be you know, practiced. But it, in one conference, uh, I gave this talk and it was picked up by news, but then it became very widely circulated all over the world. There are a lot of interviews. Then in 2012, this is a, uh, there was an article in Astronomy Magazine, it's the oldest magazine in the US on astronomy. The title of the magazine is called, What Has Astronomy Done For You Lately? Okay, that's where the question is, why should you study astronomy? All right. There are four items listed in that article. One was, you know, we use GPS every day in your car, but did you think who made this GPS? GPS was invented because of satellites sending out in the space so that we have particular direction, right? So GPS is, is a product of astronomy. Number two, wireless internet. We are talking right now on wireless internet, right? How? How it was invented? Because we are trying to, you know, in the I think in NASA, their lab was trying to connect to signals, and you know, during that process, they just discovered, oh, you can have wireless communication. So wireless internet is also a product of astronomy. RNPT, this is our work. 
So the, our work was put as one of those, the four items that astronomy can also be used to treat cancer. Fourth one, you know, there is a telescope going up in the space. It took long time to build up this space. This is the um, telescope is called James Webb Space Telescope. It's a huge one, but once it is in the space, it will collect so much data. We'll uh, know so much of various, not only stars, planets, and now uh, many things, okay? Our knowledge of um, astronomy will just have a boost, inshallah. So this is what but the technology built in to collect this information and the laser, and that is used right now in the hospitals for what? Laser eye surgery, okay? So if someone has defective eye, so you can do laser surgery to make it round or, you know, so that it perfect, you can, vision is improved. So that technology came from the buildup of this JWST. So you see that there are four um, contribution. There are a lot more contributions. So I'm taking too much time. So I'd like to say that we have a textbook which uh, connects these uh, physics and astronomy together. It is called Atomic Astrophysics and Spectroscopy. My colleague Anil Pradhan and myself wrote this book. And this book is used not only in the US, uh, but it is uh, used uh, all over uh, the world. Uh, so this is a very handbook. And I, I'm pretty sure in Pakistan, uh, the people, that, or particularly physicists, are familiar with this book. All right. Now, I'd like to uh, just move to something else about women. Why I'd like to say why STEM education or disciplines are important because they are part of life. And we need them for the advances of humanity, for knowledge, for survivability. And why females should be part of it? Because females are half of the population. Females means half of the population is half of the intellectual power to make advances. So we cannot just stay behind. So we are still, and now UNESCO says, we are much, much behind compared to men. but should we waste our intellectual power? We should not. You can see this. We are equal to man. We have different characteristics, but the brain wise, we are the same. So um, I, we, there is a society that I founded in 2010. It is called International Society of Muslim Women in Science. It has uh, right now uh, over 300 members from 31 countries. Um, the objective is to encourage Muslim women to science profession and form a network for various support, which we have been doing. Our objective is to stay in science, okay, regardless. Our motto is out of 24 hours a day, we keep some hours for our intellectual nourishment. This is so, I follow it in general, even though after doing, even during the weekend, visiting my family members or something, I will sit down even at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. and spend some time on science, okay? And you can be member, membership is free. Anybody, I'm asking Nimra to be a member of it too. So this is, you have to write to me because I need to have that consent. And now you have to fill out small thing that you can be member. And one thing that women should feel proud of is this, no, this university. When I was a student, I not only I, most of the world people knew that Al Azhar University in Egypt it was the oldest university, known existing university, which was also the first degree awarding university. But later on, I found it is not Al Azhar. A couple of hundred years before that, there was another university established in Morocco. I have to say the name uh, as correct as possible University at Kuraini. Kuraini. Kurain, and guess and now who established it? A female Muslim, her name was Fatima Al-Fihri. So we should feel good about ourselves. We always supported education, all right? This slide is for all the physicists who are in physics or related to physics, like chemical physics or biophysics and physics. All of you can be member of American Physical Society free. Okay, so all you have to do, you have to go to my website. Now you can go to my website and there is a box called 
FIP, Forum of International Physics, APS, and I have put the form there. It is a very simple form. You fill out the form and then you attach your CV with it and don't spend any money. Mail it to a person whose email address I have given at the website and then you should be member at least for four to six years, four years, minimum four years. So I would like you to be members. I know a number of Pakistani physicists become member whom I had some contact, but I have brought many people, I think 29 countries you know, to APS membership, but I would like more Pakistanis to be member of APS. There are a lot of benefits. You can come US, they will help you. Their travel grant, they can help with visa and you can apply for various awards and uh, many things that you can have collaboration which is extremely important and now collaboration makes the advances faster. Okay, I think this is my last slide. Thank you, Nimra. Thank you so much, Dr. Sultana, for that amazing, amazing presentation of your work and as well as for, for introducing uh, international the, your society, International um, Society of Muslim Women in Science. And I will be honored to be a part of it. I'm definitely going to mail you all my details uh, very soon, hopefully as well. And thank you so much for like telling us so much about different opportunities that physicists, young physicists can actually uh, take on. So I hope that the viewers that are watching can actually benefit from what Dr. Sultana has said. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, so that was incredible. We have one question uh, and I'm going to uh, display that on the screen. Uh, and this question is asking us, um, okay, so he's saying that the it's very interesting. The phenomena is very interesting of photon ionization. However, I want to know, uh, want to know whether it has something to do with infer about photon entanglement. Actually, um, if we studied photon entanglement, then probably you know the connection. Um, uh, anything you know to do with the ionization, you have to use photoionization. That's all I can say. You ionize. All right, so we have another question, uh, and this question is saying that since the since this, uh, sun is the source of life on planet Earth, although you're using all possible means to make life difficult due to human activity, is there any chance in the behavior of the sun in recent decades we need to know and how it, it will affect us? Well, affect which one planet? Sorry, yeah. Oh, planet search? Uh, yeah, is there any chance that the behavior of the sun is going to change and how will it affect us in the coming years? Oh, in the coming years, we will not uh, much because they are so far away and we cannot reach there. But in a way, it will affect us that we will have a huge amount of information that we'll need. Okay, at this time, you know, like this one is going, there's another uh, um, a satellite test is going and we have art based uh, telescopes. We are uh, studying more of these uh, exoplanets and uh, particularly habitable planets and the more we know you know the control more control we have there will be no immediate because we don't have technology to travel anywhere yet unless you know we find something to go there thank you so much for that so now i'm going to move on to the next segment which i like to call heart to heart and this this is where we'll get to know more of your story uh, and your motivation so i'm just going to jump in asking the first question so my first question to you is did you always know that you wanted to become an astrophysicist uh, and what was your inspiration or who inspired you um actually i wanted to be a, a doctor because uh, uh, I knew it is a very it is a very novel profession. It uh, gives uh, comfort to sufferings, and my parents supported it. That's how I grew up uh, now in in school. So, but there was a um, break after exam. So I I went to library uh, public library and brought a book on astronomy, and reading after reading that book, and uh, now I suddenly found so much beauty, and then. Um, I said, so much beauty, you know, it is wonderful to study, but to justify, should we study astronomy? Will, you know, I had, my father was a lawyer and my mother also studied, she also studied law, even though she didn't practice, but they didn't know what is physics and what is the importance of studying space. 
So I had to find a way to justify why physics is important. So, um, so they did not uh, understand uh, for some time. But finally, um, what happened, I did get admission at medical school to just to please them. But then suddenly, you know, one day, um, I saw a friend coming out from Dhaka University. I don't know what it is that. I went to the physics department. I already had you know, given the admission test. I had six admission tests. So they checked that, yeah, she, she had a good score. So she said, okay, classes started three months ago. If you want to start physics, you have to take admission in three days. And I, I didn't have money. <laughs> so I told my mother and, you know, so they saw something in me, then they said, okay. So they gave, she gave me the money and I took admission and started physics. And I had to justify why I should study physics and astronomy. What is the importance? Yeah. But I didn't have any particular person. It's just a sudden feeling and it came. Oh, wow. That, okay. that is just so incredible. Oh my God, you, were, you went for like, or becoming a doctor and then you ended up, you know, oh my God, that's just amazing. <laughs> All right, so my next question is, so, um, so then you got into a university, uh, into a physics university. So was, did your journey become any easier or did it just get harder from there on? Like what were some of your struggles? Okay, the struggle, it, it was, you know, um, I always knew one thing, you know, in my mind that during the exam, when uh, uh, someone examiner is checking my uh, answer, uh, answers, that examiner will not see it is a male or female or she's, she was sick during the exam or she was very healthy during the exam. I have to do well in the exam. So I remain focused to do well, you know. So um, it was, yeah, because I my parents are not very much happy at the beginning. And so they, so it was a little bit uh, tough in the beginning, but they all supported anyway. Um, but they supported uh, me uh, uh, anyway, but they didn't say any, any, anyway. Um, so, so far I just found that, you know, remaining focused in Bangladesh, studying was just to remaining focused. But here, after you go to research, the world is different. You have to know how to interact with people extremely, extremely important. You have to know how to present yourself. You have to know how to talk. It's very difficult to talk with when man is talking. You don't get the slot where you can start. I still cannot do that, but I try. You know, they keep on, everyone is talking. You have to find the right moment so you can, you can just introduce yourself there. So those kind of difficulties and uh, teaching, you know, by the family, be modest. So we don't want to intrude we don't want to say too much about ourselves. You know, he says, don't don't talk much, too much about you. But sometimes it is needed that, you know, it is not a boasting. It is just that you have, you have this knowledge, you have to interact, your brain has to be active. So you continue to interact. So th this then I lacked for a long time. Didn't know how to talk uh, much, except just, you know, writing and doing things. <laughs> So that was, I would say, a difficult the shyness, uh, not being able to present myself. I like your presentation, okay? Be like this, and you, inshallah, you will do well. All right. Thank you so much, but I wasn't always like this either. I was, what you were explaining, what you just said, I was like this too. <laughs> uh, I see. All right, so this, is, this doesn't help. So my mother, you know, she saw me, in, I used to take my mother to conferences because, my son was small. Uh, so my mother told me, you know, who doesn't have the shame gains the knowledge. So, <laughs> so I had to come out of this shameness, you know, to talk. So now I, okay. So this is our ingrained, you know, be polite, be accommodating, but uh, sometimes we have to come out. Yeah, thank you. Oh, the this is brilliant. This is actually a very good golden advice to all the girls who are listening right now. Come out of your comfort zone. <laughs> yes. All right. I, I would in ask you, yeah. Go ahead. When, okay. So I want to say, you know, when you talk about science, when you are studying, you know, because you're engaged your brain to something. And when you're talking about something different in life, you should also take that part where your brain is, you know, spend so much time, not time, you know, devotion or to it. 
to, to put that into your conversation as well. You know, it helps. So brain is listening, you know, this in our, particularly in Muslim society, sometimes uh, we don't discuss because we are, we are very modest, but you have to introduce our science idea during conversations too, even though like your mother or your friend or anyone, you know, a, a, a little bit, so I do that. Even you know, uh, someone doesn't have an education, how this is forming, I just say, you know, you, this in information, you put it there, then it happens. So like that, you talk about science you know, uh, in your regular conversation as well. Yes, definitely. That's again, another brilliant advice. Okay, so this is one question I've been meaning to ask because you have a very super uh, power, I mean, superhero title called the Iron Lady. So what is the backstory behind it? How did you get this title? Okay, so it's a, it's not a, I'm iron lady in nature. It is that I studied iron. So in space, you know, uh, there are a lot of iron. Then not only our sun, but whenever we take spectrum of various external objects, we find a lot of iron ions and they give a lot of information. It regulates floods, it regulates uh, a process, environment. So, but iron was very difficult to study in the past. And then when the supercomputers came, we started to study iron a lot. So I became a part of uh, projects, it's called the Opacity Project. It's international involving US, Europe, and South America. Um, so in, so they study, started to study atoms in a very elaborate manner. And so I become part of it. And my I did so much work on iron that whenever there'll be iron, they said, look for Nahar. So when I was in Germany, uh, Tübingen in a conference, so I was trying to get the tea, you know, coffee, you know, from the coffee pot. So uh, there's a man behind me. I didn't know he's a very tall person. So she said, give the coffee to the iron lady. <laughs> so I looked back, <laughs> then he told me, well, you are the iron lady. So then uh, there were other people who sat down together. Then she said, you know, you have done so much work on iron. So whenever we need iron data for our modeling, we searched for Nahar. So when I told it, mentioned it in the department, astronomy department, so there was the first magazine came out. So there was an interview. So she put that in the magazine and somehow it spread an you know, iron lady. No, this is amazing. And it's such an it's such a funny and amazing story. And it's I mean, I am in love with that title, Iron Lady. It's so fitting. And I think it has a lot of meaning, not just with your uh, physics related work, I mean, with astronomy, but in general, also you're an iron lady as well. <laughs> All right, so my next question to you is, um, you, since you're a founder of uh, the International Society of Muslim Women in Science, so how do you think that this society and similarly cases, what is their role in the scientific community? I mean, what importance do they play? Oh, very important. You know, something called inspiration, something called the uh, information, you have to tell uh, the women the importance and need of STEM disciplines. It's very important. So they know uh, that uh, um, we have to be in, in science, technology, mathematics, and engineering. It is, they are not easy, okay? The, this subject, you know, all subjects are important, but this is, is a particular STEM subject. They need more devotion. That is the difference. We have to, but you know the word, nothing worth comes easy. So that means you have to devote, okay? So with knowing that, and now I'm, if I'm going to STEM, because my brain is there, I never know the you know, boundary of my brain. So you have to hit the boundary of our brain, see how much we can do. Maybe I didn't study, pay attention, you know, math is difficult. Sit down and try it, see whether you can do it. First time it will be difficult, but next time it will be easier, who knows? You can be a mathematician. So we have to inspire them. And I'll tell them the importance and we need more people. We have all kinds of area or areas that we need. And there are a lot of people already in those areas. But in STEM, we have less people than we need. So women, they have to come to this field. And you have to know that you need devotion. You need detachment. When you study, you have to forget about everything. You have to detach and connect yourself to the science. Okay. The other thing they can inspire, you have to tell that why it is important. Then you have to say, you know, another thing that helps quite a bit, recognition. 
or in the news. You know, recognition I found works like magic. Recognition is not boasting. Recognition is something telling you, yeah, you did a good job. Whatever you did, it was wonderful that you did that. You made the achievement and we appreciate it. That is all recognition. Recognition, if you give a little bit of recognition here and there, they work so well. Because I have established this kind of recognition in my places and you know they are doing so well. It is not, again, I'm saying, it's not just uh, now boasting or you are arrogant. No, no arrogancy. It's just appreciation, what you did. We appreciate your work. And it is wonderful that you're making or contributing to science or doing something to make progress for humanity. That is all. And in the news also, sometimes, so I have a newsletter. So if, if I put somebody's, that's what I found out, put somebody's name is in the newspaper. No, they feel very good about it. So, so okay, other members know about me, they feel good, you know. So sometimes they will say, um, Dr. Nahar, I have written this paper or I have achieved this. So I put that in the news, if you know, whenever possible. So I know there are members who are doing excellent work, very high level, but there are also members who are not to that level, but they're still doing very good job. De devotion is there, both sides. So I publish both sides, doesn't matter who is, you know, what level. I just put them in the newsletter uh, and it makes them happy that we are sharing things with each other. Uh, thank you so much for that. I mean, that was just the brilliant answer. I mean, it sums everything up so perfectly. And yes, I think acknowledgement goes a long, long way. Even if it's a little bit, it does miracles for everyone. Uh, also, so I also want to know astronomy, what other fields in science interest you? Actually, um, of course, I, I like uh, biology. You know, if there's something new, I always read the news. And, and of course, math. Math is the basic backbone of science. No, it is um, some, seems like, you know, it is not that much uh, flowery thing, but without it, you cannot move, okay? Physics is just application of uh, mathematics. You cannot do physics without math. So math, and then chemistry, we need these chemical things, you know, because our body is like that. We have to have, we have to understand our body. So physics, chemistry, all science areas, I, I like all of them. All of them are good, very much. Okay, so um, you've given us a lot of golden advices and I, I've noted them down. I'm pretty sure everyone else has, but before like we move on to the next question, I want you, I want you to tell us one golden advice uh, that like to give to um, all those girls and women who are trying very hard to pursue a career in STEM? Like one, like the top most priority uh, golden rule you think they should follow? If they want to um, achieve things, all they have to do that use their brain to go for it. Just remain focused, okay? So um, my father said one thing, you know, if you remain focused to your objective, other side things, they just work out when you achieve it. And remember one thing, which also I say as a Muslim, if you if you want to achieve something, you try it. If you try, Allah will give you one credit. If you're successful, you get two credits. If you're not, so sometimes I try and, and I tell Allah, okay, if you don't give success, it is you, you did not give. I did my best. <laughs> if it, is, it is up to, to give me you know, a result or not. So. So we have to try and achieve things, okay? And I also would like to tell them, you know, the more we use our brain, the more beautiful we look. It is true. You'll notice scientists in general look okay. I know, I mean, without even without makeup, they always look kind of uh, and uh, good, I, I think. They look beautiful, young. All right, thank you so much for that. And yes, that's an amazing advice. Keep on trying and keep on staying focused on what you want to do. All right, so now we're going to move to a bit more like casual, non-scientific um, area of our, uh, web, I mean, of our session. And that is, I'm going to ask you some silly questions. Um, are you ready for those silly questions? <laughs> All right. All right, so very first silly question is, um, if you could visit any planet in our solar system, which planet would you visit and why? I see. Um, it will be Mars. You saw the movie, The Martian? It's beautiful. See, if you cannot go to Mercury, Venus, too hot, you'll be burned, right? 
you cannot go to beyond Mars because they are all gaseous planets. You cannot land on them, right? So Mars will be the nice place to go and the see it is so big. It's nice. It will be nice. All right. So uh, question, what are your thoughts on uh, extraterrestrial life? Like what if they're Martians when you go to Mars? We may not see extraterrestrial life in Mars. We know that. Okay. but. See, we are so much uh, far away from each other, not from galaxies. Stars are so far away. You have to be very, very smart to travel to come to our planet. You know, these ex uh, aliens. So that means they have to be very smart to travel to us. And if they are smart, you know, the smart people are in general better in terms of they are usually nicer, right? <laughs> so <laughs> if the aliens come, so I think they'll be curious, nicer. Not only that, because they come here to know they will be also very much accommodating. I think it will be nice to have them. We'll welcome them. All right, so I think this is like, you know, all the movies who show aliens as people who are coming to invade us. I mean, just shattered their all like movies. I think yeah, aliens can be good as well. We should think about aliens as being nice to us and helpful yes. as well. Okay, so the movies said uh, they have gone a little bit beyond uh, this uh, initial um, contact because uh, what happens then power comes when the power issue comes then the you know attitude becomes different so if we have to you know claim we want this exoplanet and they are saying no we want this is ours in our trajectory then there will be issue of a you know, fight <laughs> and contradiction but that's i think quite far away and uh, human beings you know we are um, quite nice we can be bad but we can be the best people too right we may know we can be political you know to work out things, the differences. So we don't worry. We will, we will be able to handle, I think. <laughs> yeah, all right. That, that's brilliant. That's great. Um, thank you so much for all those um, brilliant answers, even to those random questions. Uh, so now we still have a few questions uh, left from our comment section. So I'm going to just display them on the screen again. Um, one of those questions is related to your work. And this question is asking, um, the question is, it is about cancer treatment using x-rays. How x-rays are able to distinguish between cancerous and normal cells? Or is or it or will it uh, destroy uh, tumor cells in general? OK, it is a very good question, though. OK, so when the cancer in the x-ray is going through the body, so uh, it will, uh, no, it is focused to the uh, uh, radio sensitizing agent where you know because they are doped inside the tumor so the reason x-ray will not be absorbed by body that much uh, the reason is that you know x-ray because of the i'd say the um, energy levels so our body elements uh, are not uh, cannot absorb that kind of uh, photons extra photons to be excited only thing it can do, it can extract and absorb and uh, uh, to tear up its tissues. It does damage. Okay, it will do damage. But if we know what energy extracts to send to that place, then it will have we have minimum damage. You know, uh, right now all these medical facilities, all the extra machines, they dump lot of X-rays from low energy to high energies. So only part of the energy is going for either diagnostics or therapy. So, and rest of the X-rays are damaging the pa patient, okay? So our objective is to narrow down, you know, from this broadband to narrow band. But his question is a very correct, very good, um, because um, we'll be focusing on narrow band and so that it will be pointed to the uh, DNA or the malignant area. All right, so I think it's time for me to wrap up this uh, episode. I've had so much fun. I don't feel like wrapping it up, but I, I have to. I think it's, it's almost like 10 p.m. now. And I'm just enjoying it so much. I'm sure the audience had a lot of fun as well. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sultana, for joining us and sharing your time with us and exciting us about astrophysics and astronomy in general. Uh, for a person who did not know much about it, I am so excited and like fascinated by it. So thank you so much for sharing that and also for sharing such an inspiring story and giving us so many golden rules to follow and live by. Thank you so, so very much. 
um if there's any message you would like to give or share something before i wrap up please go ahead okay uh, thank you i'm uh, actually i like to thank everyone whoever is in the audience and uh, i don't think i answered probably everyone's question and um, so but i uh, maintain is that you know uh, i really had that uh, opportunity i want the physicists particularly to be member of aps and i want uh, um, the particular the female uh, audience uh, just stay focused to your sign and stem areas and uh, contribute okay it's important and one thing about you know to remember you know just uh, say we say you have to be firm and polite like if you want to do something and someone is objecting you say it firmly but politely you are not you know arguing or something just say i want to do it that person will see eventually accept you and if someone throws bad things on you what i say you know you have to have teflon coating that means you know someone throws whoever say something bad about you that person brain work bad things you know you did not do anything so you should not be disturbed by anything bad you know mentioned about you because your brain is clean you did not think anything bad you just remain focused to your contribution whatever you, we can do contribute i would like you to do the contribution to science particularly muslim women you should come and contribute like in other uh, races and uh, groups and uh, we are together okay and pray all the best and i like to say assalamu alaikum to everyone thank you thank you so much dr sultana and we at horsney science society would love to collaborate and have another session with you because i am honestly starstruck right now so inshallah in the future we would love to have you on again and probably you know probably collaborate on some some project maybe i hope that a lot of physicists who are listening they would contact you and we can have a collaboration soon as well so uh, once again thank you so much dr sultana and thank you to all um, the entire audience that was uh, present present and tuned in for this session uh, thank you for joining us um i uh, take care of yourself inshallah next time i will be back again with another extraordinary lady in uh, science so till then take care of yourself allah hafiz allah hafiz allah hafiz